feature presentation. Welcome back to another untitled streaming review. I am one of your hosts, Matt Rohrbeck, alongside. He's allergic to tomatoes, but he is tomato meter approved. Eric Merchin. Matt, I'm interested in looking for a new condo. Can you help me? Oh, baby. We're going to be talking about some Star Wars condos, baby. Condo Wars um, 2022. Um, I love it. I love it so much. Uh, yes, today we are talking about episodes one through four of Star Wars and or. I didn't mean that to rhyme, but here we are. Um, episodes one through three will be streaming on Disney Plus uh, starting Wednesday, September 21st. And then it'll be weekly after that. It is a 12 episode uh, season, which is uh, pretty wild. We haven't really gotten that from the Disney Plus shows. Uh, created by uh, Tony Gilroy, who you guys might know as uh, he was, you know, worked on the Bourne movies. Um, you Director know, he, Michael Clayton. Yeah, he worked uh, on duplicity. the reshoots of Rogue One. So uh, very familiar with at least this Rogue One part of the Star Wars universe. Um, but Eric and I will get into it. But we had some interesting conversations of why we think Tony Gilroy is a great choice for the show. You have uh, Nicholas Bertel doing this score. You have Diego Luna. Uh, jean Reprising his role. Uh, yeah. Uh, O'Reilly, Stellan Skarsgård, um, Denise Goh, uh, Adria Arjona, uh, Kyle Soler, Fiona Shaw. Uh, more um what's the guy's name from the bear that i like a lot too um he's great um anyways the cousin cousin from the bear is in this i'll get his name in a second um uh oh even moss bakarak what a great yeah. name uh, also in lena dunham's sharp stick uh, has yes. a small role in that and very he was good. in girls as well yeah um yeah. and he was great in girls so um eric we're back on video we're back with good audio um we're we're past tiff which I'm is thinking we're back uh i mean we're sort of we'll still be putting out reviews and a, a wrap-up show for for the 2022 toronto international film festival over the next kind of probably two weeks maybe even the rest of october we'll see yeah. um but you guys should check out all of our uh tiff content over on untitled movie reviews you're already in the right spot if you're listening to the audio version or just search untitled movie podcast on on youtube those don't have video versions but they're still up on youtube one-stop shop untitled underscore cast on letterbox yeah we have reviews up for people's choice winner the fable men's we have women talk or sorry we haven't done women talking yet we will um, though have um, women talking um i totally thought we reviewed that i <laughs> just blanked on thinking well, when i did. saw that you posted it i in know the group, yeah, yeah. i thought you were meaning like okay like we have some stuff that's coming soon i totally we talked a lot yeah. about so just before we get to Andor, like quickly, um, and we'll talk more about this in the regular show with the TIFF wrap up, but, um, you know, there were a number of reviews that uh, we weren't able to record based on scheduling and screening time. So as Matt already mentioned, we will be getting to all of those reviews to the point where you'll be sick of us if you subscribe to Untitled Movie Reviews and seeing, you know, a constant, Let's like, be a constant you guys are still flow. doing TIFF stuff. <laughs> hey, there'll be a constant <laughs> flow, man. We'll put out probably a podcast per day for the next you know three weeks or something like that but we did yeah. uh do all the heavy hitters so yeah sorry the two people's choice winners uh in um the fablemans and weird the al yankovic story which took home the midnight madness award uh we also have uh, glass one, onion glass onion swimmers, one of the runners up yep uh, bros ba brother banshees of uh, in a sheeran triangle of sadness empire of light the whale uh you already said bros and brother i like movies so there's still a good amount of stuff up there for you guys right now for tiff content uh plus also i want to i want to mention this yeah. you did a really wonderful interview for she oh uh, thanks a, a attorney at law so um I I let you you take that just quickly in terms of uh, no yeah I interviewed uh, Anuvalia who is uh, the director of episodes uh, five six and seven of She Hulk Attorney at Law had a wonderful little ten minute conversation with her so you guys can go check that out on the main Untitled Movie Podcast uh, channel Eric has an interview with um, uh, Lila Nugabauer. Um, I got that right. I listened to it so many times, Eric. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, from Causeway, which was a from the director film. of Causeway. Yeah. Um, she's the director of Causeway with Jennifer Lawrence, so that's up there as and well. And you also as, have an uh, interview with Zach Krager, yeah. the director so of, of Barbarian. There's lots of stuff for everyone. So uh, please go check all that stuff out. And we'll have we're going to be busy over the next couple of weeks, both with you know new films like Don't Worry Darling and and 
Amsterdam, and, Amsterdam, and, and Smile, and other things. So, um, Clerks Three, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I probably will go see that. So, anyways, uh, let's get into Andor. Uh, Erica, take it away. Yeah, so this is the prequel series to Rogue One, and it follows Cassian Andor, played by Diego Luna, as he joins the fight against uh, the Empire. Uh, the first three episodes are kind of the origin story and him growing up on an Outer Rim planet called Canari, um, and sort of how he's adopted by uh, Fiona Shaw's character, and we see kind of him in Star search- of Super Mario Brothers. Yes, a great theater actor that you just trivialized as a co-star. No, trivialized. I like her in that movie. I know, I know, I know. know. But she is, uh, I mean, a lot of people will also recognize her as uh, one of the Dursleys. Aunt Dursley, yeah. Yeah, Aunt Dursley in in Harry Potter. Um, And so with Cassian, you have, you know, the classic kind of origin story of him in search of his sister, but also kind of joining the rebellion in an indirect way. I think one of the best things about these first four episodes, specifically episode four, that's directed by Susanna white, or is it Dan Gilroy that directed episode four? I think I Susanna right white here. maybe directed episode three or four. Cause Susanna white also directed uh stone scars guard in our kind of trader. I'll, I'll find it. Keep going. Yeah. And so with, with, with the first three episodes, it's kind of the foundation of Cassian as a character and sort of, Susanna His White story. was episode four. First three episodes are Toby Haynes. Okay, cool. Um, I think maybe Dan Gilroy wrote one of the episodes. He wrote episode four. Okay, yeah. Um, episode four is excellent. Um, it's where the show kind of really begins to find its own footing. And I think the thing that both Matt and I really like about these episodes as a whole is that it is getting away from the Skywalker saga. It is not about Jedi's. It's not about bounty hunters related to Skywalker. No, no, no. It's not related in, you know what I mean by related. It's the political and it's the public perspective on the burgeoning empire and what that means in the different sort of layers of which, you know, these characters are, interacting in a kind of cloak and dagger espionage-esque storyline that very much borrows from um, Western and war genre tropes that is actually quite refreshing because it's going back to what Star Wars was, which was influenced by, you know, a lot of other movies and not Star Wars itself. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I and I should say, spoiler free, I know that's in all the writing and when you clicked on this, it already said that, but we won't be spoiling any major kind of plot points or anything just stuff from like the trailers and stuff like that han solo Uh, dies at the end (laughs) so does cassian Uh, um, but that is that is true um yeah i i really enjoyed the shit out of these and i I was quite surprised uh it, it it is and i've liked most of you know modern star wars i think i'm sort of in the minority there where I like both Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, and it's been a while since I saw it. Um, I've liked Mandalorian, and I've liked Obi-Wan. Um, I was kind of mixed on Boba Fett, where you really liked Boba Fett. So Star Wars has been all you know across the map. In the, in, across in, the galaxy. In, the, in modern Star Wars. But uh, I totally agree with you that this felt like kind of completely – refreshing where i saw you know sides of star wars i haven't really seen in either a very long time or ever when it comes to a condo building or an apartment building and like that's the stuff that i really loved is that galaxy building is that world building is that like on the ground kind of with either the politicians or the you know this burgeoning rebellion and just the people living and how they're dealing with the empire ruling the galaxy and how the little how smaller planets that aren't really super important to the empire are dealing with policing and and their people and and, and different things like that and like and that's what i really loved about it i know the show is called andor but it does feel like more of an ensemble piece and about more maybe he's you know the catalyst to the whole series and he will be that one who kind of you know ultimately what we see in rogue one is like you know is the rebellion essentially but like i i do love that we're seeing these little kind of sections of the galaxy and all these different planets and you know compared to boba fett and and mandalorian and obi-wan to an extent where we've been on tatooine a lot um sand it's it's just sand yeah it's in everywhere and you know shooting in the volume and things like that where 
you know, I'm hit or miss on the volume. I think it's a really cool piece of tech, but like I'm starting, you're starting to kind of see the cracks in it where like it looks just as bad as green screen at times. So this show feels like they shot, you know, on these vast sets and on location. And, you know, obviously they had to shoot in the volume for certain things when, you know, whether they're in ships flying through space and in different, you know, getting some background shots. But um, I really just felt this sense of scale and, 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 in everything and whether they're in a, a, a forest planet or in a, in Coruscant or, or in another planet, like everything felt like dense and populated and like big, like star Wars should feel right. And, and that's what was most surprising to me because I, I have felt like star Wars has felt like a little, you know, singular or empty a little bit where everything's either focused on the Skywalker saga and even Mando and, and you know Obi Wan especially is like all tied and back Boba to that. Fett, yeah. yeah, and Boba Fett are all tied to legacy characters or tangentially connected to you know the Skywalker saga. Even if Mando's dealing with the stuff on Mandalore, and but we're gonna get into the cloning stuff that will probably tie into Snoke and and things like that. So this just felt like, and I know ultimately this does lead to the Skywalker saga, right? So it does. Yeah. It does, but it just feels like in this series, it's focusing on the Empire and their rule and on the Rebellion and on the people who live on these planets, and and that's what I really loved, and I really liked the look of it. I, I really like the cast. I think Stellan Skarsgård is killing it in this kind of, not to give anything away, but this like dual role, and I think that's what we're going to play with. Like a lot in this series is like, you know, uh, double, double agents, crossing. double agents, triple agents, kind of things like that. Like triple H. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, that's the kind of stuff that I really loved from this cast. Like I like Diego Luna, like uh, the Andor character from Rogue One, like I thought was fine. Like I think starting the movie with him and when he just murks that guy at the beginning of rogue one, I was like, Oh damn, like this guy just straight up murdered this dude. <laughs> like, uh, and then it's kind of, but it wasn't really his movie. He was one of maybe the two co-leads in that movie, I guess. But, um, I never had a strong, you know, passion for that character. So even when the series was announced, I'm like, do I really want this? And then like, as you get into this, uh, you learn more of his backstory, which I did like it, 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 you know, it touches on a lot of, I think the series will also try to have a lot of parallels with, you know, you know, stuff that's going on today or has been going on forever in our politics and, and how our, you know, government well, colonialization, and, right? Uh, yeah. Like, colonialism yeah. and, and, yeah. and colonial, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. of, of Cassian's planet and all this stuff, his backstory is really kind of interesting to me. And like, and, and those are the kind of things that you, you know, the empire is shitty and you know that they do horrible things, but they were, you know, you dealt with the Sith and you dealt with like the dark side more than like the government part of it, which so that might scare people away because how the prequels <laughs> dealt with, right. the with trade politics and, and stuff, and stuff like, like that. that. But I think this is taking some of those, the most interesting things. Cause I think, you know, even in the prequel stuff, there's something interesting there about the world building of how this galaxy works. Right. It's just, no one wants to sit in a fucking government meeting for, for two hours in, in, in attack of the clones. It's like, uh, this show has find, found a way to kind of keep it exciting, even though it is a very slow burn over those first couple episodes. Like it does pick up in episodes three and four, I think. Um, but I don't know, man. I just I've really kind of enjoyed the shit out of it so far. And and it does feel refreshing. And I hope we don't see any Jedi or or even bounty hunters or anything like I just it, I like this seeing this different side of things. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, you know having tony gilroy come in and be the creator and and you know one of the head writers um really benefits from not treating the material with a kind of preciousness and i think like even just him picking cassian andor as kind of the focal point of this series kind of shows that because in rogue one there's a number of characters where it's like oh okay if you were going to spin off a series for one of these people you know there there are probably about a half a dozen other ones that we would both personally pick over uh cassian but it makes the most sense with where the story is going and there is also this really fun in episode four that i'm sure we'll continue on uh heist component that's coming up that i think is really integrating into again the kind of classic war tropes of you know infiltrating a location and trying to you know pull off something that's basically like a suicide run or a suicide mission and so 
with all of that, like Tony Gilroy is bringing that in. If, if you go and listen, I've talked about this on the regular show. If you go and listen to his interview that he did with uh, Brian Koppelman on his podcast uh, when Rogue One, post Rogue One, when it was um, kind of the discourse was coming out about it being very disjointed and having, you know, two filmmakers kind of working on it in the reshoots. Gilroy admits that he's not a Star Wars fan. Like he came into this thinking like, what am I going to do with it? Because I don't have the same reverence for the material that so many people do. And he approached it more with Rogue One as if it was, you know, a, a battle of Britain storyline than it was a Star Wars storyline. And I think he's applying that same thinking behind this series where you can see it's like, it's still Star Wars, you know, it, it, but it has more of a gritty grimness that would belong closer to something like Blade Runner than, yeah, than Star Wars. I thought of Blade say. Runner a couple times. There are a few shots there that does feel ripped right from Blade Runner or from a Ridley Scott, you know, sci-fi movie or something like that. Like, um, which I'm totally for. And I totally agree with you where, you know, I love star Wars, you know, I think, you know, I, I do love the kind of Easter eggy, like, Oh, here's, this thing that you remember or this thing like it can be done well um but it is nice to bring someone in who just does not give a shit who's just like my main focus here is like i'm not here to like i'm here to make you enjoy this but i'm not here to kind of be like i know how much you love star wars and here's some star wars stuff is like and i i love it for that like you know it doesn't need to be like here's a nod to rogue one or here's a nod to the skywalkers or here's this or here's a planet i mean you do go to planets that you do remember but like it, it's done i feel like in an organic way and, and it makes sense for the story and like and to your point eric like he's focused on how do i just tell a good story and i'll apply this universe to it and then you kind of get the bo best of both worlds i think and i think more creators should you know it is nice to find a director or a, or a showrunner or a writer that is like, I'm a, I've been obsessed with this universe since I was a kid. But it is also nice for someone to come in and go, I don't know what the hell this is. <laughs> like, all you dorks like this stuff? Let me try. <laughs> and like, uh, I think that's kind of fun too. And I think you need that balance. And I think, you know, the light and the dark. So I think they do yeah. a good job here. Yeah. It also is very similar to like like Star Trek in the sense with how it's handling the politics, but even like someone like Nicholas Myers who directed yeah. um, both uh, Wrath of Khan and An Undiscovered Country wasn't a Star Trek fan. He was coming in like with – especially with Wrath of Khan, like looking at it as a submarine movie yeah. uh, more so than anything else. And I think that kind of helps. And, you know, there, I, I think the connective tissue between a lot of these Star Wars series, especially The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett and now this – and even a little bit of Obi-Wan is that you're looking at characters who aren't necessarily pure of heart. They're anti-heroes yeah. within a world that is willing to double cross and, you know, basically take a hold or take advantage of other people. And so within that, you have characters that are more complexly drawn in terms of what their motivations are, whether to serve themselves or the greater good or a little bit of both or maybe indirectly trying to do both at the same time and i even like that the villains you know being the empire you know you you see the various forms of bureaucracy not only with the security core but with you know the 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 characters that we so often you know are, are portrayed as villains it's it's a job to them are they yeah. apathetic absolutely but it's interesting where it's like again like that corporate kind of like you don't necessarily sort of even see the evil things that your corporation is doing, right? No. Like you're just an employee and you think that they are doing it for good reasons and some not. Or they're, or they're like, wanting a promotion. They're, yeah. they're wanting to, they, they're wanting to usurp uh, or they know someone they, yeah, else yeah, exactly. for position. Right? Or you just, you can't, you know that they're in control and what else can you do other than just give in to them and like, and go along with it. That's what, you know happens a lot in dictatorships and things like that too so yeah I, I love that bureaucracy of of that kind of stuff i love the space cops that we get to see on the smaller planets like it, it really like that's the kind of stuff i'm like oh these are just like you you said like mall cops of, of a planet or whatever right paul blart and security like, core yeah like that kind of stuff is is a blast um I we mentioned the condo building like stupid things like that where i'm just relatable like, i i yeah, and that's what Star Wars is 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 best. And like I I just didn't think I'd be like, damn, that's cool. I haven't seen like someone go visit an apartment building 
in Star Wars. And then like that's the kind of world building stuff that I mentioned earlier that I just think is like it is great, like taking real world things and putting them into this universe of how it would work on these different planets and just seeing the, you know, even the the class structure of the different planets and stuff like that, seeing the high class element, which we've got a little we touched upon on these first couple episodes and seeing those people that are struggling at the bottom and and stuff like that. Like, you know, there are tons of parallels, like I mentioned, to what's going on, you know, now and has been going on forever. And I think that makes it even more relatable and interesting from a storytelling standpoint. And um, yeah, the action, I, I know you'll get into maybe a, a few criticisms there. I, I thought it was exciting and I, 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 you know, the, the blaster battles and we don't get a lot of, you know, uh, there is some, there's no dog fighting or anything like that. There's some traveling in ships, but that's it. Um, but it's brutal at times too, just in the way of it, some executions and, and different things like that. It feels more adult. Like Star Wars has always ridden that fine line of like, is this for kids or is it for adults? And, you know, at times it does feel like it's trying to do both and then kind of muddies what it's trying to do because of that. And uh, I think there is a place for stuff specifically for kids and stuff specifically for adults because this universe is so vast that I feel like you can kind of do both just try to pick one or the other and there can be that stuff that's like in the Marvel territory which is like the mainline Star Wars stuff that kind of feels like it is that you know late teens kind of thing but adults can enjoy it kind of stuff um but you know even the John um spider-man director why am i blanking on this john, john watts. watts um his show is supposed to be more like kid focused right and it seems like that kind of amblin sort of based on some kids maybe it'll be more kid friendly than something like this right like so you're speaking about the uh, the skeleton the crew skeleton crew yeah and yeah. so i feel like you know I, i'm excited to see lucasfilm kind of play around with that and and see like oh this show is more for adults like this does i know it's been overset already with the embar social media embargo and stuff like that, but it does feel like more of a, I don't even want to say HBO show because I feel like that's been overused, but it does feel like more of a prime time premium television show. And that doesn't mean that like Boba Fett or Obi-Wan or, or Mandalorian doesn't feel that way, but they, I don't know how to describe it, but they do feel like more like popcorn-y kind of entertainment um, yeah, Book of, of Boba Fett is is more of a kind of family, so, and, and, and Andor is not like gritty to the point where it is, you know, like an HBO no, series. No, no, you where, could like there's, yeah, it's not Game of Thrones or, or House yeah. of Dragon in that way, but it you, is, a like, kid could still watch this. I just think they might be bored. Yeah, but. yeah, exactly, because it is a lot of 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 dialogue pertaining to bureaucracy and politics and maneuvering and that's again, what we mean by more adult like just adult yeah. themes and with dialogue driven and not like a ton of action but yeah. but it is incorporating a historical component to it and even though we didn't like denny Villeneuve's dune it feels closer to that than like a traditional star wars kid Pulpy friendly kind of yeah yeah action yeah even, adventure even, even, you know, you mentioning like, you know, the comic book thing, like if it were on the comic book kind of like pipeline, it would be closer to something like Watchmen than it is, you know, like the classic Star Wars stuff, yeah. you know, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think having this kind of show makes sense to be sort of maybe geared towards a little bit of a, an older audience maybe you know people that are in their early teens specifically will get something out of this and feel cool watching it as well you know mm -hmm. like in terms of how there are some historical components from the real world being brought in you know mentioning you know the battle of britain but also uh, colonialism and sort of you know hostile takeovers yeah. and, and like those things are integrated more into this series than they have been in the past when it comes to star wars Even not the that they haven't been patriarchy there. like kind of systems yeah. and yeah. yeah and just the mundanity of, of going to work like some of this does feel like you could you know reshape this and make it like an episode of the office or something with the imperial people being like <laughs> yeah. oh another day at the job where you know this character is trying to screw me over and take over my job and be you know a hot shot here um, and that all works really, really well. And and going, to, you know, you mentioned that, um, you know, with with the action sequences, talking about it more, I appreciate that it's not 
you know, even with the edits and the transitions, it's not doing like the classic Star Wars, you know, swipes and sort of, you know, going from one scene to another. And the action is kind of more in the vein of what we've seen recently with a lot of these shows and also other series that incorporate action beats where it's kind of handheld shaky cam. Yeah. It's in the moment. It's supposed to be disorienting to a certain degree. That kind of took me out of it a little bit, but then it also won me back in episode three with the staging of one specific sequence that kind of felt like your classic Western standoff. Um, and it does yeah. something really interesting in one room that I don't want to give away, but in terms of what it's using, you know, to its advantage in, in a moment of um, sheer kind of um, escapist entertainment, quite literally. Um, and yeah, and so like there's there's a lot to really admire and like. I think that, you know, we, we've only seen four episodes, so we can't completely comment on it. And and something else that you brought up that I think we should reiterate this feels like it is a show about dual identities and the duality of characters mon mothra playing both you know a civil politician but also kind of doing her own thing and helping the rebellion and then you know we've already mentioned stellan skarsgård and even you know cassian andor becoming you know something new that's not just you know a classic kind of like I, I'm, I'm taking this on as a lone wolf kind of thing you know he's he's joining the fight whether he wants to or not and creating a new persona out of that so i think that there's a lot of like in, in terms of like even just like looking at that from a superhero point of view you know the duality of characters where's mm -hmm. where does the where does the, the the person behind the the cape and cowl uh end and where does you know those characters the, the superhero persona begin so yeah. it's it's all there yeah you nailed it yeah i've um yeah, I'm really enjoying the hell out of it. Like I said, like it is only four episodes, so we've seen a third of the series. Uh, talking about that quickly before we wrap is like the episodes are between 30 and 45 minutes uh, with credits. So, you know, in and out, but they do feel like, you know, dense, I, I, even at 30 minutes and at most, like I said, 45. And I think that those are a good length for this. And like, I like Disney also experimenting with different, um, you know, run times, different season lengths and things like that on these shows. So, you know, we're getting the Daredevil series, which is going to be 18 episodes, you know, this being 12, like it seems like they're open to doing not just the, you know, six or nine episodes, depending on if it's a 30 minute show or a, or an hour long, uh, hour long being 40 minutes plus or whatever, like it, I, I like that. And I feel like 12 episodes does feel like we'll have enough time to kind of get into, you know, there's a lot of characters, there's a lot of planets, there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of like a lot going on in the show. So I'm kind of glad that we, you know, 12 episodes feels like a, a good amount. And that's going back to maybe that people comparing it to an HBO show or something like that. Like, even an Amazon show or Netflix, they do get up to those like 10, 12, 13 episode seasons where Disney is always kind of stuck to that six or nine. It felt like at least in, in star Wars and Marvel. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely glad that it's 12 episodes. It doesn't feel like it will overstay its welcome. Even after four, like it still seems like there's a lot and I hope they kind of do more of that. Like I don't, I'm someone who I'm like so glad we got away from like the 24 episode seasons of stuff like that's way too many but that sweet spot is somewhere I think between you know 10 and, and 13 like I'd love to see the Marvel shows kind of everything feels a little rushed at six or nine episodes where I just feel like I know the budgets it's these shows are expensive to make but um, who knows if it'll consistently be good or entertaining throughout um 12 episodes but i like the idea of that on paper as i'm seeing it play out yeah and and i think another thing that's really important to add to that is that there's an actual end point to this yeah you know there are some series that you know when they you said start two them, seasons right and that's it yeah and it's going to basically be sort of almost like a backdoor pilot to rogue one uh you know where where it ends but i think that works in this case because you know star wars has been following that continuity of, of finding pockets to tell these stories in between, you know, the, the feature films. And if you have a show that has an end point, a real end point like this, 
it feels like it won't overstay its welcome. Um, yeah. it, it, it's not a show that can necessarily keep going past Rogue One uh, unless you want to do something that's yeah. metaphysical. I mean, I, I don't know. But but in terms of what this is, there is a structure to, you know, getting to that final scene or that moment where it reconnects with the film. And, and I think that also kind of helps it or benefits in that, like, you know, okay, like they're going to put all their effort into these 12 episodes and making the best thing that they can. And it won't get diluted over time because there will only be two seasons. It's not going to be, you know, an ongoing thing where it feels like, Oh, I remember when, you know, the Simpsons was in its prime and now it's, let's lo- learn know. about Andor's tattoo on tattoo. Yeah, exactly. On tattooing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, like it, it, it's one of those things where like, yeah, I, I, I love lost and, you know, network television in general, you know, was the only choice that a lot of people had back in the day, but it doesn't necessarily benefit the storytelling. You know, you have to kind of stretch things to a point where it's either going to break or it's just going to feel like, okay, you're just, you know, padding for time or you you don't really have anything interesting to say. And that's even happened with shows that we, we love. You mentioned lost, you know, twin peaks in season two, you can see a lot of that um it's, I like it's season one two of, of twin peaks though i but. do too but you but you can you can tell that some of the sort of you know the the magic of that first season doesn't yeah. translate into season two because lynch thought it was going to be a one and done and sure. that was it and so you can it's like oh we're making more of these okay let's like come up with these storylines and introduce billy zane into this um so yeah so there's andor is one of those shows where it like it does feel like you know each episode is going to matter and it's going to mean something yeah. uh, moving forward into what will eventually reconnect to Rogue One. Yeah. So I think we both think it's very good. Everyone should go check it out. Um, even if you haven't been super into the Star Wars stuff coming out lately, I think you should give this a shot. And even if you were mixed on Rogue One, like um, I think some people really love Rogue One and I think those people will really, uh, really like this predictions wise there i mean we know where this ends <laughs> um yeah. uh i'm just curious we know that you know mon mothma uh is uh a, 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 basically a main character or you know a, a co-lead in this ensemble kind a of central thing. figure throughout um, the series yeah and we know that forrest whitaker will show up as saw guerrera um do you like this um <laughs> And uh, do we think anyone else from Rogue One shows up or any other Star Wars? Is this a show to have that kind of stuff? I know we said. Um, well, it's isn't not Alan, be very... Alan Tudyk's um, robot character going to make an appearance You'd at think some so, point as right? well? Because, because he they was already an have a bot, right? And he already had a relationship with Cassian, yeah. like, right? So you'd think maybe season two, it doesn't necessarily have to be this season. Like, I Shout out see... to B. I do like B, the yeah. robot that's in this. Oh, yeah. Who does the voice for him? But. Um... I forget. I look. But, uh, that but robot I love, I is love great. Me. He looks like Wally a little bit. Like um... kids will like that. I think that's the one thing that kids will enjoy. Like if they're watching it and they're kind of bored with their parents, and then they see this, you know, red little robot with wheels come in and has like an adjustable kind of neck. Star Wars um, is so great at making new droids um, that just are incredibly likable. <laughs> And like him trying his lag of trying to catch up with his, you know, his memory and stuff like that, I thought was great. And um, but, yeah, you'd have to think that Alan Tudyk will be in at least probably season two or maybe at the end of season one. Like I could see Alan Tudyk being like in this sh- season two, like for the majority right. of it. Right. Like, yeah, um, maybe, you know, they reprogram him in in the end of this season and then maybe it'll be like terminator where he starts off as a bad robot yeah. and then he becomes the savior of uh andor yeah i actually do think that that's probably what's going to happen then um uh sorry i'm getting messages i didn't think that that would come through yeah i'm i'm curious if you'll see ben mendelson uh pop up or i don't think felicity jones showing up makes any sense um no um, but I do think maybe in these seasons you'll probably get um, a few appearances from Rogue One people. Or maybe other characters within the Star Wars universe that make sense, you know, in terms of, like, the politics of it. Yeah, um, you got to think, like, with what they did with Obi-Wan, like, are you going to see Jimmy Smits and, and Leia again? I know Leia would be closer to looking like, uh, you know... Carrie Fisher. Carrie Fisher, but do you cast someone else that... 
I don't know. You already did the the CGI thing in Rogue One, so I don't know. If Will you can Dash do that. Rendar show up? That's all we want, Eric. Dash Rendar and Watto. Like those are the two things that. When are we going to see Watto again? He's got to show up. Jar Jar's coming back some somewhere, right? But you'd yeah. think the Obi Wan show would have been that, but maybe they do a season two. But like, I know people hated that character, but you got to think like that, that would be a huge pop for that character to come back somewhere. <laughs> like, right. Um, so, but I do want to dash Rendar, um, you know, kind of, I thought they were going to do something with that character. Cause like that timeline, you'd think maybe with the, in Boba Fett or. Yeah. Book um, of Boba Fett. Cause that's around the same time that shadow of the empires. I mean, like, again, I don't think it's Canon, but that's kind of where that story within the N64 game takes place. Yeah. It's like right after like the end of the empire and the beginning of the new um, Republic. regime yeah um but yeah obviously eric and i are huge dash rendar stands so kind of want to see that anyways uh go check out first four episodes of andor the first three will be streaming september 21st probably either by the time you're listening to this or um or soon thereafter uh and then episode four will be next week and then it'll be weekly after that uh i do agree with eric that it really kind of finds its groove in episode four which is probably why they gave us four episodes but i still think those first three are incredibly enjoyable they are more of a slow burn uh stick with it those first two episodes or something are kind of slow but um i really think that if you dig that world building and kind of the ground level star wars stuff like i think you'll really kind of find a lot to to enjoy here so go check it out we're not going to put a rating on it because it's you know only four episodes of a season um so that's that so like we mentioned earlier please go check out our tiff content we have a ton of stuff up over on untitled movie reviews we'll have a tiff wrap-up show which should be up for you guys uh to listen to very very soon um probably as you're as you're listening to this uh, on the main channel which is untitled movie podcast we'll be talking about uh, the best films of, of TIFF 22 and the worst films. Uh, so please go check that out. That is uh, UMP, Untitled Movie Podcast 132. Uh, one-stop shop for everything, Untitled underscore cast over on Letterboxd. And uh, go check out some of my other work around the internet. Uh, Family Feud Canada is uh, season four is uh, now playing on CBC and CBC Gem Monday through Thursday at 7.30 PM. I was a producer and a writer on this season of Family Feud Canada. Uh, so go check that out. Um, and then follow me on all those social medias at Matt Rohrbeck. And I'm Eric Marchin. Uh, you can find more of my video reviews on rogerstv.com slash cinema scene. There will be an upcoming wrap up episode of uh, TIFF 22 with Matt Rohrbeck. So if wow. you want a condensed version <laughs> of this for a half an hour instead of probably three hours, uh, you can check that out and follow me on all the social medias at EM6211. Until next time. Condo, condo, condo. That's my Forrest Whitaker. Bye. <laughs> Saw Guerrero. <laughs>